Hi, I'm Lee Kelso, host of the Health Call Live Radio Hour, and I'm glad you're here to learn more about a disease that I'm sure you've heard of, but may not know much about. It came to the headlines recently when CNN news anchor John King announced that he is one of the one million Americans living with multiple sclerosis. Let's learn more about this disease, what it does to all of your bodies, and what hope may be there in the future. And to do that with us is Tim Kutze. He is the Chief Advocacy Science Officer and Services Officer for the National Multiple Sclerosis Society. Tim, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, Lee. It's, it's a pleasure. Uh, so uh, the, the John King story really kind of drives home an important point, doesn't it? I mean, this is, this is a disease that can be largely invisible. No, that's right. And, and John's story really is a reminder uh, of, of a couple things. One is that, um, people, you know, as you said, nearly a million people uh, live with this disease. But, you know, as he also illustrated, you can live with MS and have a successful career, live powerfully. But also in doing that, you know, you face a number of challenges. Uh, and, you know, John's story is a, is a you know, reminder that for many people who have lived with MS today, they say how, you know, they saw some symptoms, they didn't necessarily go to the doctor as quickly as they thought. And what we want to do is try to change and encourage people that, you know, as you see symptoms, see the doctor, look for opportunities, look for options. But the important thing, I think, as John stresses, stressed in this interview, is to the support system you have around you uh, is really critical and vital as well. Yeah, let's get into all of that. So uh, those symptoms, a lot of people don't recognize uh, what is happening to them. I've read that uh, people kind of sometimes will feel a tingling in their extremities or maybe just a sense of heaviness in some of their limbs. Is that about on target? That is. And so what's happening in MS, just to help define it for your audience, is that um, it's a disease that affects the brain and the spinal cord. And um, for reasons that we're still trying to tease out, um, your immune system, which is normally geared towards fighting off viruses and diseases, um, decides to turn on um, the nerve cells and specifically the insulation that surrounds these nerve cells that's so important for those nerve cells um, working properly. And so what happens is when that damage starts happening, it can present in a number of different ways. For example, as you say, some people can say it's tingling or numbness or perhaps you know a dragging of a leg. Um, uh, you know, sometimes people will have visual problems where they start having difficulty seeing out of one eye uh, and they can't quite figure it out. And when the doctor looks at them, they have what we call inflammation of the nerve of the uh, you know nerves that connect the eye to the brain. Uh, and so that's where, you know, the, the, the challenge for many people is it's, it's so sometimes nondescript and you're just like, oh, it's just tingling. Oh, why am I worrying about it? But, you know, it's those symptoms that it's really important for people to look at and pay attention to. Well, none of us want to be, you know, hypochondriacs, but uh, give me the, yeah. the sequence of symptoms or the collection of symptoms that you think I definitely need to go see a doctor about. Right. So, I mean, I think with a vision, if, as I said, you know, if, if you go to get some glasses like I do and the ophthalmologist says, I think you might have something we call optic neuritis, which is the medical term for inflammation of the nerves around your eye. You want to follow up on that and see the go and see the neurologist, see the specialist. If a person is having, you know, difficulty walking or they start having numbness and, and tingling and those kinds of things, definitely um, seeing, you know, seeing those symptoms. The challenge is that sometimes it can be all over the place and they seem can seem to be disconnected. Um, but what we're learning is that, you know, people who are diagnosed with MS start actually seeing the doctor more frequently for a lot of different things. And, you know, the key thing is if, if you start feeling like you've got neurological symptoms, like I said, anything with a vision or movement and the like, get with a neurologist. We know how to diagnose this disease. And, you know, by using different tests like MRIs, for example, where they can take a picture of the brain, we can learn very quickly if a person does or doesn't have MS. You mentioned earlier that the, uh, the immune system is attacking what's called a myelin sheath, that insulation mm -hmm. around the nerves, and that does show up in MRI. Um, yeah. Do we know at all what's going on here, what sparks this, why some people have this problem? Yeah, so that's, a, you know, getting at the cause for MS um, has been one of those mysteries that, you know, uh, has, has really challenged us. So there's a couple, there's some things we do know. We know that a person's genetic makeup can influence whether or not they're susceptible to MS. We know um, that, you know, so, you know, exposure to some viruses like the Epstein-Barr virus or um, or having low vitamin D levels 
are all what we call risk factors. And you know what we're what we're learning is that it's a combination of risk factors like you know a person's genetic makeup, exposure to an event like perhaps having mono in childhood, for example, uh, mononucleosis, which you know was associated with the, the virus Epstein Barr virus. All of those come together. Uh, uh, to make a person um, more susceptible to developing MS. And it's those triggers that then we believe cause a person's immune system to then start um, attacking the brain really as an error. Uh, and, you know, the, the, the immune system is not supposed to be doing that, um, but for some reason it gets uh, misdirected. Uh, and um, what we're trying to do is understand what causes it to get misdirected and what are the early clues that we might have that it's getting misdire misdirected. Because if we have, you know, if we can do earlier and earlier diagnosis, we could then go in and try to stop the disease in its tracks and make it really a tiny part of a person's life. Yeah, we'll come on to treatment in just a second. But uh, let's go back to some of those uh, kind of the information about this disease mm -hmm. in general. It tends to hit women more than men. And right. uh, that's kind of unusual. Well, I guess not. I guess autoimmune diseases generally are more common in women, right? What, what age is onset typically? Right. So, I mean, for, for many of your viewers and listeners, they, they may hear that of MS as, a, say, a disease of young individuals between 18 to 35. But what, we'll, what, we're, saying, what we're learning now is that actually it's a, it's a disease that can affect people across age, age ranges. Um, you know, we have individuals sometimes who are 60 years old being diagnosed with MS. Admittedly, that's rare to, for a person at that age to be diagnosed. Um, we also have, um, you know, there's some children that are diagnosed with MS, ch ch children as young as six. Um, again, those are the rare parts of the rarest parts of the spectrum. But um, MS, you know, typically, you know, oftentimes it can be, you know, mid, you know, twenties to thirties, um, where oftentimes you'll hear the initial stories of people being diagnosed. Um, but as you saw, as that graphic showed, you know, there's also you know, ge you know, there's geographic distribution, and we're trying to get a handle on on you know, you know, we we used to we there had been some lines of thinking that you know MS was associated with more northern, colder climates. Um, we're we're beginning to try to understand and tease that out better. Um, the gender distribution of more women than men is one that, as you point out, affects um, goes across a number of autoimmune diseases, and that is likely also tied in. With some biological basis of the disease that we're still trying to get our arms around. You know, you mentioned vitamin D a bit earlier, and uh, again, the geographic distribution of the disease. It's more common in the in New England states, uh, the mm -hmm. Midwest, where we're located, that second most common prevalence. Uh, so that does kind of raise the question of, hey, we don't get a lot of sunlight around here. Is there any evidence at all that vitamin D supplementation is protective? Right, so that's an important question, and we actually are doing some studies um, in this in the United States to look at vitamin D and its potential, both as uh, an agent uh, for, as you say, uh, protection, as well as pr potentially to modulate the immune uh, the immune aspects of the disease. Um, we also have collaborated with our colleagues, actually, in the Australian MS Society, uh, where they're doing a large um, clinical trial of individuals looking at high dose supplementation. Uh, with vitamin D to see if it prevents individuals from developing MS. Um, we hope to have the results of that study um, sometime next year. Uh, and, you know, it's a well-designed, you know, highly controlled study that, um, you know, we did in, we helped, we were proud to support um, with our friends at the, the Australian MS Society. Uh, and that, that'll give us insights into um, what may be needed for a, what I just described as a population level effort to try to get people across the country to take higher levels of vitamin D. Um, you know, as you can, as, as we have witnessed over the last few, you know, last 20 months, you know, anything on a large population scale is complex. Uh, and so we're, we're going to take some lessons from what worked uh, to try to see if we can make a difference. Uh, just, to, just to put a cap on that, what do you consider high dose? Is this a daily dose in excess of 4,000, 6,000 units? How, where we uh, it, it tends... It tends to be in that level. I'll just, you know, that that would be something to actually, ha I would stress for a person to talk with their doctor about because, you know, you want to make sure that you're taking the right dosing, um, that you're that they're monitoring the levels. Um, I think, you know, it's, you know, several thousand units would, was what normally I, I understand the physicians will prescribe, but it's important to also, you know, you know, work with your doctor on that 
as yeah, well. Yeah, of course. You know, it, high doses of vitamin D can can be risky for people with kidney conditions, and and so yeah, mm -hmm. I get that concern. Uh, so is let me just one more question on that: Is those high doses high doses of vitamin D is that therapeutic or preventative only? So th we're we're trying to get at both of those questions. So um, definitely um, the data. Uh, the epidemiological data, you know, really points to that, you know, high vitamin D can be a, pre you know, higher doses of vitamin D can be a preventative, but there is also data that suggests that vitamin D could have a role in what we call modulating the disease or, t or tailoring the response. And uh, we've been involved in funding a, a study of that here in the U.S., looking at adding vitamin D along with the one of the existing MS therapies to see if a person's disease course can be altered. Yeah, so there are a number of medications available now that uh, relatively recently on market. Uh, let's mm -hmm. talk about what they do and some of the side effects. Sure. So, I mean, that's one of the good news about MS is that, you know, as, as neurological diseases go, so these are diseases of the brain, um, you know, we have seen incredible success in, in treating this disease. We now have more than 20 what we call disease-modifying therapies. And what these treatments do is that they target the immune system they, that, that is acting up in MS, and they basically alter it so that a person's immune system actually, you know, is dialed down in terms of the attacks it does on the brain or, or shifted so that it's not attacking the brain. And so, um, you know, you, we have a number of these, what we call immune therapies. Um, they all focus on tackling a different part of the immune system and tweaking it or adjusting it or serving as a break on some of the of the white blood cells that are involved in attacking the brain. Um, you know, some of them, what they do is they, the, the treatment actually goes, is a very specific and targets a specific type of white blood cell, the B cell, um, that is involved in producing antibodies. I think many of your viewers may be familiar because we talk about the B cells in terms of generating the antibody responses against the COVID uh, virus. Uh, while in MS, also we know B cells. Some B cells have have turned on the on the brain, and so one of the treatments actually targets those and actually removes them from the bloodstream, and that works very effectively. Uh, there are other treatments that target the other white blood cells called the T cells that are also involved in the immune system, and and they're again what what the drugs do is they 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 either serve as a break on the activity of some of these immune cells or actually specifically cause them to die so that they're not going into the brain and the spinal cord and damaging it. Um, overall, you know, these treatments are, are quite effective. You know, there are some side effects that people, you know, need to pay attention to and work with their doctor on. Sometimes people will get some flushing, some rashes and different infections and the like. And so each one is distinct. Uh, in terms of what it does, but the good news is many of them have really high safety profiles, as we call it, um, which, you know, uh, enables people to take them over a lifetime. You know, and I, and that's one of the issues that caused uh, John King to bring his disease to the surface is his concern about being immune compromised and, mm -hmm. and then pressing the story of uh, COVID vaccination. So that's what brought that out. Um, yeah. So tell me about uh, what life is like for a patient with MS. You know, I, I, I've watched some videos of patients describing not knowing day to day what they're going to be able to do. That's so frustrating. Mm -hmm. Certainly. And I'd say that was absolutely the journey that many patients, you know, 20 years ago when I joined the MS Society would have said, you know, I, we don't know. There's no treatments. The treatments are just barely, you know, making a difference in my life, you know, and, you know, you know, they lived with uncertainty. What's going to happen? Am I going to lose mobility? Am, am I going to lose function? The good news is that story is changing. Um, the treatments that I've described, the ones that, you know, what we call high efficacy that, you know, if people start on them, they preserve, they preserve function, they preserve the brain, they maintain, you know, employment. Um, and, you know, people live full and powerful lives. Um, especially when they are diagnosed, say, within the last 10 years because of the availability of some of these uh, really impressive treatments. You know, I, I do think part of the challenge, people will say, you know, is, you know, one of the things they wonder about is how will my employer respond? Because, you know, they may have fatigue, which is something that we do see with MS. People experience significant fatigue. Um, they may um, find, you know, have challenges if they work outside in a, in a job, for example, that, you know, requires a lot of exertion and people get hot, you know, overheating, for example, can make, you know, your nervous system actually 
a kind of hyperactive in MS, which can also be challenging, especially if somebody lives in a hot climate. And so all of those parameters actually uh, can, you know, affect how a person lives day to day. Um, but the important thing I would stress is, particularly for those individuals watching your show who may have just been newly diagnosed, is to really get with your doctor and start on a treatment plan because choices that individuals make early in the disease have effects 20 years out. And that's one of the things that it's really important to stress that, you know, getting and managing a person's MS early in the disease course is super important. Now, the, the other piece of this I'd say is that what we're learning from the research is that, you know, even that those individuals who lived with MS for some time and, for example, didn't have an option of having one of the disease modifying therapies may have lost some function now. Um, you know, things such as uh, rehabilitation, for example, engaging in any, any, almost any kind of exercise actually can have beneficial effects on how a, a person's uh, nervous system is functioning. And it, it may seem obvious, right? You know, well, exercise is good for us, and that's absolutely true in general. But for people living with MS, what the science is also telling us is that it can also create an environment in a person's nervous system where the, the nervous system can adapt and rewire itself in a way that can be beneficial. And so those are some of the aspects that I'd say are changing uh, in the story about MS. Yeah, you know, I think uh, it tells a story that exercise and particularly weight bearing exercises are very good for the immune system and it helps mm -hmm. modulate the immune system overall, reducing inflammation generally in our bodies. And, and that sounds like that's something that would be a goal of, of therapy with MS. Uh, tell me about what the society does and, and how do you make a difference in my life if I'm a patient? Sure. So, um, so our goal here at the society, our mission um, is to cure MS while empowering people to live their best lives, uh, and and that's our whole mission. So, as I talked about, you know, we're we're, you know, deeply committed to to funding the research to to get a cure for this disease and um, to make it, you know, to to really uh, make MS um, disappear. Um, but a critical part of that also is um, empowering people. So we fund science, we do a lot of, you know, fund a lot of research in the United States and internationally, and we partner with government agencies to fund research uh, uh, that's aiming at understanding what causes the disease. But then for those living with MS, we're here to be a supportive partner to them. Um, we do that through our, our MS Navigator program, which is a way, uh, a service we provide to the community where an individual can call up and say, you know, at, at this point, many people are, are signing up for Medicare well, if a person's living with MS and they're navigating, finding, getting on Medicare with the insurance, we're here to support them with that, with our MS Navigator team that can help them walk through that. Or if a person um, is facing a question about whether or not I should disclose my MS to my employer, our navigators are there to support an individual m moving through that journey. Um, we also are here to provide guidance and insight. Um, so if a person living with MS, like John for, John King, for example, is wondering, well, what should I be thinking about in terms of COVID-19, what it means for me with MS, um, people can go to our website. We'll have the, the latest guidance from, a group, from our experts around what they should be thinking about with the vaccine. We encourage everyone to get vaccinated and also to then also think about, you know, their disease-modifying therapies in that context. You know, we also just recently... Um, put out guidance um, for people who are thinking about the stem cell transplant therapy that I know is a feature in Selma Blair's documentary. Uh, that is a, a, an option for some people uh, affected by MS. And so, in, you know, what we do is share information, let people know here's, here's the best information uh, that you should be thinking about when it comes to the type of stem cell therapy Selma Blair had and also different kinds of stem cell therapies people might be hearing about uh, that our experts can give them advice around. Well, you certainly have a lot going on. It sounds like you do quite a bit to help patients who are suffering from multiple sclerosis. So thank you very much for joining us. That is Tim Kutze. He is the Chief Advo Advocacy Services and Science Officer for the Multiple Sclerosis Society of the U.S. Thanks again. Thank you, Lee.